Trading futures and options on futures involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all traders and investors. Oftentimes in futures trading, you have a high combination of leverage and volatility. And although this could be an equation for opportunity, it's also an equation for risk. So be careful, only fund your futures trading account with risk capital. My personal definition of risk capital is money I could afford to lose doesn't change my lifestyle or overly stress me out. As human beings, we make bad decisions when we're under stress, so be in a good spot. Remember, micro contracts could be friends. Take it easy on the day trade margins. You get plenty of leverage without maxing out on those day trade margins on a regular basis. We'll be taking a look at a real-time simulated live Ninja Trader trading platform today, and none of this should be construed as trade or investment advice. Past performance not indicative of future results. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to See the Futures. My name is Jim Cagnino with Ninja Trader. It is November 15, 2023. Appreciate everyone being here at See the Futures. We have a great guest today. Uh, first time on the show. I'm going to bring him in right away. Uh, Toby Mathias is with us today from Anderson uh, Tax Advisors. Toby, good morning. Hey, thanks for having me, Jim. Did I get that right? It's Anderson Business Advisor. Anderson Business Advisors, everybody knows it's just as Anderson. We've been doing this for 25 years. But, you know, it used to be Anderson Law Group, but we're not just lawyers. we got the CPAs, the bookkeepers. we got everybody there. So this is great. And, and you know, I my, my accountant is also an attorney. And in my thought process as well, I, I, I want to have I want to have an attorney behind me just in case I get into trouble. <laughs> I've never gotten in trouble, thank God. But um, that's, that's a double barrel benefit. That is uh, a lot of people don't realize that they it does start to merge over like and so many people are used to being ping ponged. You know, you go to your lawyer and they say, hey, set up this, but then go talk to your accountant. And then your accountant says, what the hell are they doing? And they say, you should really do this and this and go talk to them. Then you go back to the lawyer and says, well, my, my accountant said this. Oh, they're all wet. You know, they're not considering this. You end up like after about 10 of those you start realizing that somehow they've conspired with each other to just build the hell out of you. Yeah, I, I know. I've been in that boat too for other businesses as well, but uh, um, it happens sometimes. But so you, your specialty though is kind of focused on traders, right? Uh, investors as a whole. So it's real estate, okay. it's stock, it's uh, even note investors, but where we cut our teeth and it was 1999 that we opened our doors is really on the stock market when it first came out where people could uh, retail trade. You know, a lot of folks don't realize that before that it was a nightmare to try to actually be in the market. Now we're so used to be able to pick up an app and buy and sell. And they, you don't realize that it used to, that, that, that little thing right there would cost you a hundred bucks and you had to use a broker, you know? So uh, all of a sudden it came on and there was all sorts of, uh, bizarre issues because nobody had really contemplated retail investors. So before let's go back in time before 1999 and then we'll catch up. So you spent some time in Seattle for school, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, grew up in Philadelphia, moved out to Seattle, moved on to an island in the Puget Sound. So I went from Philly to an island, which uh, that was easy transition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lived in lived in Seattle I think, for 25 years. That's where we started Anderson. I have a partner up there and an office up there. Um, and uh, yeah, Seattle's an interesting place. Uh, spent a lot of time in the Pacific Northwest. Played uh, soccer for Seattle U. If you, if you have any soccer folks, you'll know. Uh, and uh, came down to Vegas in 2007, just in time to watch it implode. You know, it's, uh, it's a spectator sport here. We just Hey, how, how how far did your house drop in value? Oh, mine's down fifty. Oh, that's nothing. Hold my beer. Um, you know. It was... So so this is this is the so this is the mortgage crisis you're referring to. Obviously, two thousand eight hit pretty hard. Las yeah. Vegas probably probably was hit harder than other places, right? It was the number one city for just getting smacked. I think we lost seventy five percent of our values, which then you you learn to get into real estate investing when that happens when there's blood on the streets. Right by by real estate. Well, there was uh, there there was a lot of blood on the street during that period of time. Got it. Well, so you you settled it. You settled in Las Vegas. You identified the sweet spot, nineteen ninety nine, where we had 
really uh, the emergence of the online trading community for retail, uh, not only futures, which was, I think, a leader back then as well, but also, you know, the direct access, NASDAQ direct access level two day trading that, you know, a lot of folks have uh, participated at when those really nice trading platforms came out uh, way back then. And that was a niche that you kind of boom, hit right away. Exactly. Because there, there, there's uh, a lot of unfairness in the tax code. I'll just be the first one to say it. Uh, when you are a, a stock trader and you're trying to do it as a living, uh, you're not allowed to have expenses like you pretty much can write off your margin interest against your uh, income. But uh, if I opened up Toby's, Toby's pizza shop, you know, bought myself a big old, maybe I got three unis in my, and I decided I'm going to be a pizza guy. I can write off just about everything that's associated with that business, but you can't do that. If you're a, if you're an investor, they just, for whatever reason, it's not codified yet. There's no objective test. So they use this thing called trader status, which I, I'll explain it to you if you want to get into the weeds. But uh, it was just an absolute, uh, it's its insanity. It's never been fixed. And it's been going on since back in the, uh, in, in the 90s, even before that, because there was folks that even when you had to go through a broker, they would still do massive amount of transactions. I remember one case. $15 million a year and they wouldn't let him write off his office or anything. They, they basically said, Oh, you don't get to write those expenses up because you're an investor. You're not a business. And uh, yeah, you get very, very limited uh, as far as your ability to write things off. And then the, 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 the real punch of it was if you have uh, capital losses, they don't let you use that against your other income. You can only use it against capital gains. So, you know, you'd have people that would have these, years where they they they'd make a bunch of money and then the next year the market would pull back or they just had error in judgment or they got caught with something and they ended up with a big loss and they couldn't write it off against their other income they ended up carrying it forward um actually I, I'll, I'll i'll refrain one thing they let you write off three thousand dollars a year of your capital losses against your ordinary income but you know for people that were uh traders and they were getting involved in this it, it could be a a, a pretty negative experience when hey i made 100 you know let's say it was the end of the year and they made 100 grand they're in there is just ecstatic they did it doing short-term trades <clears throat> so it's all ordinary income which means it's at your bracket your normal bracket added in with all your other uh, wages and things like that so it's zero to 37 percent now back then it was zero to 39.6 so you get hit with a your tax and then january comes along and you the market does what it likes to do in January, which is just, you know, and it just, just it would just, it would just bottom out. And uh, all of a sudden you've given a lot of it back and uh, you wouldn't get to write that off. You'd have to, it would just, oh, you can carry it forward. So if you ever make more gain, you can, you can offset it. And and we saw a lot of people with a lot of uh, big losses that they would end up carrying forward. So let, let's go back a little bit. So whether you're trading, equities, you know, stocks, options, or futures, you potentially could have some real expenses, right? You Maybe you're subscribing to a, a, a news feed or a Bloomberg terminal. Uh, maybe you need extra monitors. Maybe you need to have better internet. Maybe you're renting an office space, right? Yeah. Just to kind of get out of your house or whatever you're doing. Um, as an individual trader, you have real expenses that you have to invest in um, as part of that uh, enterprise. Correct. And you're not allowed to write them off <laughs> and, well, unless, unless you qualify as a trader. And and there, there is one other exception. I'll just say this, that uh, it's not so much the expenses, but you, you you can at least write off the losses. And that's if you're doing spot uh, Forex futures, or you're doing a 988 uh, treatment, which you have to elect. And then you could write off those losses uh, as ordinary, but the income is also ordinary. So you, you lose all the benefits of doing futures, which is this beautiful 60, 40 split where, you know, if you can do math and I, th I think it's like 26% is your tax bracket on futures, uh, no matter how rich you are, you could be in the top bracket and you're still only paying that. You could screw that up if you want. <laughs> if you're doing Forex, you could say, I want 988 treatment because I'm losing money and I want that loss, but you don't get the uh, deduction still. And uh, it's, it's a but, real but problem. For for that election, Toby, don't you have to do it ahead of time? You can't do it after the fact. You're supposed to do it ahead of time. You actually, 
Yeah. So you, you could have like the year reprieve or oh, this was the election I made, you know, and I treated it this way. But for the most part, if uh, if you have the option, you're going to uh, no pun intended. But if you have the option, you're going to do the that 60 40 split. You're going to treat them as I think they're called 1256 contracts as a, yeah. if you're doing futures just because the tax benefits are so great. Like, you again, I just if I can cap my tax bracket, I'm going to do it. Everything else is kind of, hey, I'm really trying to write off losses. And if, and if that's what you're doing, uh, you're in the wrong enterprise anyway, because uh, you should be having an expectation of making money. Yeah. So it's interesting because in the early days, which, let's talk about the 2000s, people mm-hmm. would come to futures eventually. They'll end up at futures eventually. They want to trade uh, futures. And at the end of the year, if they were new to it, they'll say, hey, my accountant needs my buys and sells for all my transactions. And my answer was, well, you'll get a 1099. You don't need that. And that was a, a, a big piece of confusion for a long time. Uh, it used to be that you had to track your sale, your, uh, your your buys and sells and securities. And so they would use all these different softwares. Now there's a reporting requirement by the brokerage houses to actually track these things. But it used to be that if you were securities, you were supposed to track them and you had a little spreadsheet or whatnot and the accountant always wanted it. Uh, there was, I gotta, I'm trying to remember the big, the big software that people would use, you could download it in and would do some tracking. We have yeah, with futures, they just give you the the net. And th- there's a reason for that. It's because it's called mark to market election, which means uh, when you're doing futures, they treat it as though you sold all your positions on uh, on 1231. It's not the case with a uh, person who's an investor. Uh, if you're an investor and you're holding positions, it's not until you sell them or until they, if it's options, until they expire. Um you know, so you're, it's it's very, very different. But get this, Jim, just to go down the tax rabbit hole, there's this thing called trader status where people will say, hey, I want to be a trader business and I want to be in securities or futures. It's all kind of the same to the IRS. But hey, I am trading every day. Let's say that you trade four days a week and you're doing at least four to five trades a day. You're over, I say about 750 trades. You're probably good during a year round trip. Um, so you're, you're like really active and you want to be a trader, then you can elect to be marked to market and where they, they treat it as though you sold everything on December 31. And I remember people doing this and I used to get into a fight with this guy who was an accountant and he was pretty popular and he was in some of the trade journals and we would have this little spat going back and forth. And I was like, this is nuts. And then Qualcomm happened. And I think it was in 99 or 2000 Qualcomm ran up like a beast at the end of the year and then it just dove like for three months it just tanked i think it went up i want to say like 600 bucks right at the end of the year it was just doing this crazy every time you'd turn on the tv oh it's up again another 20 bucks you know so everybody's making i had leaps on it so i thought i was a genius i I was gonna i was ready to retire because i was so dang smart and uh like oh look at me i'm a trader um and so these folks that make the mark the market boom you, they treated it like you sold everything on that just on that uh, December 31st. Well, if you were one of those people and then you didn't sell right away and you held your position, there's a good chance you couldn't pay for the taxes that were owed on that come February, uh, come March and uh, April. And I remember that year distinctively because you had people destroyed because they'd made that mark to market election. And they're like, why did I do this? And I was like, because if you do that, then your accountant can write off your losses against your ordinary income. That's why they did it. So, the, so the the bad news is you're going to get completely hosed on a on a deal. You didn't sell it. You shouldn't have. Like it went up and it went down, and they they treated it as though you sold it at the top of the market, and you're just going to get the snot kicked out of you. But but the good news is you can write it off. <laughs> like, <laughs> congratulations. You know, yeah. But, yeah. But I've, I've yeah. Never you, yeah, you win. You win. So let what let's say I I want to achieve that tax status for myself. I'm I'm trading futures. Maybe I'm doing some options on the side. You know, every day I'm doing it. I don't have another job. You know, this is it. Um, you maybe I'm successful. Maybe I'm not. How do I have to? What do I have to do to qualify? So there's no actual test. The uh, okay. test they use, and you, you go, you can pull it up. I think there's a publication on it. I'm trying to think. Is it 426 or 429? One of those. 
Uh, but it's frequent, regular, and continuous. And then you go to court to figure out whether you meet the facts and circumstances. So I used to say, hey, you want to get audited? <laughs> Put trader on your uh, on your tax return. And here's why. Because if you don't do anything else, the gain's going to end up on your Schedule D. Like, here's my capital gains. And then you're going to write off expenses on your Schedule C. And if anybody knows what that is, that's a sole proprietorship. But will you have no income. So you just have this big loss. So you're like, hey, IRS, look at me. I have zero income, but 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 all these expenses. <laughs> yeah, you're just like, please audit me. So I would see all these folks getting audited all the time. And I'd be like, gosh, bless it. There's a better way. There's a there's a workaround that's actually quite simple, which is when you're structuring your 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 whole business, is you have kind of a family corporation that's flowing around out there and just have it be a partner in all of your other endeavors. So if you have real estate, if you have stocks and all these things, depending on the type of activity, that that corporation may be your partner. And so you're like, hey, I never get to write anything off. Yep, you're never going to get to write anything off. But a bunch of the income is flowing into that corporation and it's going to write everything off. So quit worrying, right? You're going to get your deduction. So, you know, you're going to so, get, go ahead. Yeah, no. So as an example, when you say corporation, could I just set up a, a gym and Ninja Trader LLC? As an example, yes, and then open, and so then I would open up my brokerage accounts as that LLC, not as me personally. Uh, well, what I would do, so there's actually two pieces that are necessary, thanks to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, uh, because they did away with miscellaneous atomized deductions. But that's a, we we get into the weeds quick. But uh, you have an entity that's a holding entity for your different types of assets. So so I would actually put a brokerage account in an LLC. I'd probably have it taxed as a partnership and I would have one of those partners be an active business. Like if, if, if it was, if it was me and my family, I would, I might have, you know, me LLC taxed as a uh, corporation, you know, or whatever it might be. And the reason I'm doing that is because that, that main business that is going to manage my other LLCs, so think that I have risk assets, I have a bunch of real estate, and I have some stocks and all these things. I have a single management entity that's going to be that corporation. And that corporation is going to incur all the expenses. How is it going to get money? It's because it's going to receive part of the profits or it could be paid a management fee. In either circumstance, what I care about is, can I write it off? Right. And and if I don't set this up as a partnership in the world of securities, the answer is no. If I do set it up as a partnership in the world of securities, then so long as there's profits, it's going to have money and it can cover its expenses. And then I know there's accounts out there. Oh, it's going to have to qualify as a trader. No, it's not. That's not what it does. It doesn't trade securities. It manages these other LLCs, which is since the beginning of time, pretty much, you can have management entities. Everybody does it. Family offices all do it. Um, and you look at it and you say like, hey, this is a very much, this is a simple approach to solve an issue. And what I don't want is to get audited and to have to deal with the IRS. So I look at the audit rates. The audit rate of a partnership is a fraction of 1%, less than a quarter of a percent. In fact, it's an asterisk when you look at it uh, on the uh, publication 55 and they put out all this data, they just don't get audited. And then corporations are right there with them. They almost never get audited. You know who gets audited? Traders. <laughs> and you know who else gets audited is taking that earned income tax credit is going to get you about a 0.4%, right? But, but when we put people side by side and you start saying, who gets audited? Where's the real risk? The biggest risk is to have that sole proprietorship on your return, that Schedule C, you literally go up to the last time I looked, it was table uh, 17B and they, they quit publishing it about three years ago, which is annoying. You used to be able to see exactly it was 2.4%, 1.6%, 1.8%. It's always quite literally 1,000% higher than everybody else. So the last thing you want is a Schedule C on your return, unless maybe you zero it out, like maybe... But that's not what you're doing here. You're creating a loss and you're just asking to get audited when you do that trader status. So we've just never done it. We've just tried to do anything other than because it's not an objective test. It doesn't say, hey, Jim, if you trade 800 trades, 
you qualify as a trader. Nope, there's no such test. What they would say is, Jim, was it frequent, regular, and continuous? What was the average holding period of your trades? Uh, is it how you made your living? Did you spend at least four hours of every trading day? How many trading days did you actually trade? Oh, it looks like you were at 70%. A regular business works more than 70% of the days. And then they would deny you trader status. There's actually a case just like that, where the guy made a bunch of money in six months and took the rest of the year off, traveled. Oh, that wasn't that wasn't frequent or continuous, right? You know, businesses don't don't take off half the year. I'm like, I have lots of businesses that like Spirit Halloween, <laughs> they work for like a month, right? There's lots of businesses, but with traders, they just they're just looking for excuses to deny you your deduction. So I just don't do it. I just say, you know what, I don't I don't really want it. But this is doesn't this conflict a little bit with the you know the pattern day trade rule where there is rules on how you qualify as a pattern day trader. Yep, twenty five thousand dollars or more, and yeah, and yeah, it's, it's it, then. But that's not a tax rule. That's a pattern day day trader rule for securities. That's the SEC. It's not the uh, the IRS and Congress doesn't hasn't gotten involved in it. So, you know, it would be really easy if Congress actually said to qualify as a trader. And all we're talking about is the difference between being an investor and being a business. When do I rise to the level of a trader business? Well, for individuals, there's a presumption. If I make money, uh, you know, three out of five years, they have a section 483. So I need to make money, profits, and then it's a rebuttable presumption. There's lots of businesses that lose money. There was a famous one. I forget the guy's name. I think he wrote uh, wrote Midnight Train to Georgia. I forget the guy that wrote it. But he lost money 17 years in a row trying to make his kid famous in uh, in music. And they said, okay, you can have your deductions. You were trying to make money, but you know, in that industry, it's just really, really, really hard. It's like, like, but there's this, there's at least a statute on it. You don't get that. They don't have a statute on being a trader. They could, but you have court cases instead. And if 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 we've learned one thing about judges, oof. (laughs) So well, let me ask you though, in 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 the structure that you're suggesting. Um, does it for the regular retail trader who's going to have an account um, size that might be a little smaller uh, mm-hmm. size account? Is it worth all the expenses to set it up that way? It, well, that, that's a great question, and it really depends on what they stand to gain out of it, right? I would say that you need to have about at, at around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars of deductions if you can offset that much profit. It's it's probably worth it. But remember, futures are traded on, you know, the, the taxes at 60-40, 60% long-term capital gains, 40% short-term capital gains. It ends up being, I think, 26.6% is the, the total tax bracket on it. So I could just say, hey, if I wrote off $10,000 that I wouldn't otherwise get to write off, it's worth $2,600 to me, plus my state, you know, maybe it's worth a little bit more. Um, is it worth it to set up an entity and operate it on an annual basis and have a tax filing requirement for that? It's probably going to be pretty, pretty much a push, right? It's not, it's not really going to benefit you that there's, Hey, I have the estate, uh, benefit of it's not in my name. So if something happens to me, it's easier to have somebody else come in and get, uh, get access to those funds. I have asset protection. Maybe there's that, that benefit, uh, but you, you know you're right on that line, and I don't know whether it would make sense. Uh, it's everybody. It, it's up to that individual. They have to make the decision themselves. If you're making a hundred thousand dollars a year and you have thirty thousand dollars of expenses because you go to conferences and things like that that are disallowed explicitly for investors, and you like to spend money on education or maybe you have a, a trade group that you belong to, and they're spending those fees. Those folks may say, yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I can't write this stuff off otherwise. I'm yeah. going to do yeah. it as so, a family yeah. office. And, and there's a lot of expensive potential education. I mean, buyer beware. You got to be careful because there's a lot of, what I'll, I'll say it, bogus uh, education where you pay a lot of money, you don't learn anything. But it's it's part of the, there is a continuing education process. And you always have some really good educators out there that charge money. And it costs money to go to, go to trade shows and online trading expos and all that stuff. Yep. And you can't write them off as an investor, which is the weirdest thing in the whole world when I look at it, because every business 
does continuing education every like I'm a I'm an attorney I'm required to do it I have to do continuing legal education every flipping year every every other year I have to report it but I have to constantly be going to these courses right could you imagine hey uh, you can't write that off what are you talking about you know that would that that would that would stink all if I was that business uh, but yeah the tax rules aren't fair. They're not really designed for fairness. They keep this ambiguity there because it benefits them. Uh, there's so many cases where you're like, really? Really? You're going to deny that? Oh. Like, There's so many cases out there where people get denied trader status. And it really was the way they made their living. But the courts always, they're really good about finding a way to, oh, no. Yeah, no, you don't quite meet. Hey, Jim, it, it looks like you... You were close, but you don't, you know, no, no cigar. Or what we oftentimes see is this mark to market election. They want to, uh, I'll, I'll put it this way. Trader gets you the ability to write off your expenses on Schedule C, but you're still reporting your income on D. If you want to make the income, a th those losses into ordinary loss, so I can use them against my W-2 income and I'm not subject to the capital loss rules, I need to do a mark to market election. So I have to do two things. So there's a whole bunch of court cases where somebody loses money. I think there was a lawyer who was a big PI lawyer and I think he lost uh, 10, 15 million bucks, right? So we're not talking about a small amount. If I can write that off against my income, it's worth five or $6 million in tax savings. If I can't, then I just have 15 million of lost carry forward that I may never make and I never I may never get to use. And the IRS, you know, looks at him and says, nope, um, not going to happen for you. Uh, no matter how big the volume is, they're going to find a reason uh, as to why you're not qualifying. And you just don't want to put yourself in that situation. You have to go in front of a judge. It's expensive. If you've never had to pay lawyers to go to court for you, just just think of the joy of a few months of that. And you're dealing with the IRS, you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty and stress. And it's like, yeah, I just, I just don't want to do that. Yeah, and you would think, I mean, all this subjective stuff would eventually, there'd be precedent set eventually where it's no longer subjective. It's one of those things where uh, they now have enough cases that are guidelines, but just remember, these aren't even really precedent. <laughs> This isn't Supreme Court. This is the, the the tax court. And you'd think that they would follow some of the stuff that they've said in the past, but I don't think they're necessarily obligated to. So you see some really strange opinions where, you know, it's almost like they're like there was a guy who actually had an office in a securities firm. And he literally would investigate every day. But but they do have one bright line rule. And this is what he he violated. If your average hold period is greater than 30 days you're not a trader. So this guy was definitely managing his investments, but think Warren Buffett, right? Yeah. He was trading his own account. He managed millions of dollars. He did well, and he just wanted to write off his expenses. Nope, you're not a business. Wait a second. I buy some low-cut Levi's and I get a, a couple tools and I could be a plumber tomorrow, right? I could and I could start writing off all my expenses. We all know the guys that do it, right? You know, and they just immediately open up their business. And they're a sole proprietor. They can write off everything. They don't have to prove that I plumbed seventy five percent of the days that I was. That's where I made my main living. There, there's no such requirement for the rest of the human being. You know, the rest of the population doesn't have that. But for traders, hey, we're just we're just going to turn up the pain on you. So I just try to avoid it completely. I'm like. A, Trade inside your retirement plan. It's exempt, right? If you're, <laughs> you don't get to write off your expenses, but you're not, you're not paying tax on it. Like get a, get a Roth IRA, get a Roth 401k. There's, there's ways to get $66,000 a year into a, into a Roth. If, if you're creative and you know, a tax guy that knows what they're doing, but you know, and then trade there. But realistically, if, if, if you are somebody who's getting started and you need those little bit of uh, deductions and things like that, like you're right, you're, you're, you're intensive, you're doing a bunch of programs or you're, you have a mentor that you're meeting with on a weekly basis and you're spending some money. There's a, again, the workaround is just to set it up as a, uh, as a family office more, more or less. 
Wow, that's great information. We're up against time. I have like a hundred more questions, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna table those till next time. Hopefully, we'll get you back on the show sooner than later. Anytime. Love, so I love I've, the investors. Love the investors, Jim. I love the fact that you guys are out showing people, empowering people, so that they're not at the mercy of some. You know, hey, I gave my money to this guy at Edward Jones or one of these places. I think he's making money for me, right? Yeah, power yourself and do it yourself. There you go. So what's the best way for folks to find you, to reach out to you, say hi, or follow you? Uh, the easiest thing is just go to my YouTube. I just type in Toby Mathis and look at YouTube. I got about 680 videos up right now. Like you, you, there's a lot of these subjects. Um are, are there so you can go in there and do a little bit of a deeper dive if you want uh, my firm's andersonadvisors.com like if you want to go on there but there's 500 of us like it's it's, it's not just me I have a really good team my guys are uh, and my gals are just awesome people and uh and everybody tends to be a pretty active investor so like you're gonna you're gonna find the people that are like what do you do and then they're gonna be very interested in what you're doing and it's not because they're just asking you the question is because we're genuinely interested in what you're doing because we're all just twisted investors. We, we love everything. I like, go oh, futures. Yeah. You'll probably have somebody who's like, what futures? Tell me what you're doing. Yeah. Hey. Awesome. You know, awesome. I mean, it, it's, it's more fun that way. All right. Very good. You heard it folks. Uh, Toby Matthias, YouTube, go find them. Um, appreciate you being here with me side by side. It's early in the morning for you in Las Vegas, right? Uh, yeah, we, we just we just came home. I mean, the clubs. I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, this is. I, I always I always think a casino when he would come home and he'd make pancakes for his kids and then go to bed. Um, yeah, no, no, it's 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 not that early. It's eight o'clock here, so we're not, we're not perfect. Perfect. Uh, everybody who's viewing, appreciate you guys being here with us today at See the Futures. And I do want to remind everybody: most important message of the day. Please be safe out there. Be good to each other. See you soon.